who's going to be moderating. Uh, and so I guess we'll begin. Uh, one quick thing, just remember that if you are going to the Collaboration Summit tomorrow, to please go and register again. And uh, with that, we'll take on. Hello, everyone. Uh, we had several submissions on talks about education, and we just happened to have, uh, well, we didn't just happen to have Carol, we asked Carol to do our <laughs> keynote. Uh, but there was an interest to talk about uh, the role of education in open source and also the role of open source in education. And all three of our panelists today sort of have different experiences, but also different perspectives. So we won't just talk about you know, teaching open source or using open source as a teaching tool, but we'll cover a whole wide spectrum of this. Uh, I'm particularly interested in this because I've, uh, just as an, a, as an educator, um, I try to use open source in um, my projects. I also believe strongly in uh, what Google's doing with the Coden and the, uh, the GSOC. Um, I was a student myself and I also mentor, uh, <laughs> um, but also uh, as part of open usability, we try to model off of GSOC in trying to educate people about open source, use it as a teaching tool, that sort of thing. So uh, I have a few standard questions just to warm you guys up uh, and to let people know about your own experiences. Um, and then, you know, anytime anybody has specific questions or if you guys want to talk to each other, that's fine. Because really this is mostly, uh, it's, it's a round table discussion. And we we want to, you know, get as much out of you as possible about your experiences uh, about open source and education. So the first question that I have, maybe just spend a few moments going down the line and talk about uh, what is your, your experience or role in the project? We've sort of heard a little bit about what you do in education or how it's related to you, um, but just maybe you know refresh us or give us some details that you hadn't given us before. So we'll start. Yeah, my participating in education has first been participating in school in this project starting started with uh, another person called Petter Reinhausen who's still committing a lot to that project and the reason was that we needed a uh, infrastructure program so this was really easy for system admins at schools just to set up the whole school environment and also the whole municipality maintaining everything from a central spot the major idea was to share uh, the all the building construction in that software in also using the software in people's native language which is Norwegian, not English, with no software is uh, by default. So it was a couple of other things which was really important for that, and we were kind of su really successful in the beginning, and uh, we still are uh, in that project. But the core thing about sharing knowledge is still what I'm burning for regarding both that part of that project, but also in, in Qt. And uh, I think having access to spoken tutorial and other things is what we should be aiming at also at KD. I will talk more about that later. Okay, Alex? Uh, well, my experience somehow started when I was a student <coughs> and I started to use the tools that I kind of felt I needed. And well, so at some point I found out some calculator I really liked. So when I was a little older, I wrote the same calculator myself and I wrote it I think better and everything. And well, with time, this calculator was called Calgebra. It got into KD Edu, and well, with time and a lot of uh, KD Edu sprints, well, you start to think like not just about your uh, application, but about the community around and how you can get the the students and the teachers to use your tools. And well, somehow I got dragged to doing KD Edu presentations and while trying to get the most out of it. Uh, right now we, uh, we've been working with some web designers and, and a local designer, I don't really know what's the proper name. And we've been uh, renewing all the KDIU uh, phase, uh, like new website, new logo. Uh, Tomorrow, actually, I'll be going to Bilbao, where we're start, start starting our annual, uh, yearly uh, sprint. We'll, we'll be having uh, people from all over Spain coming there and sharing their, their experiences while, while using Linux and, of course, KDE Edu, because we are like a very rare uh, module that no other project has like this kind 
of mm -hmm. tools for education and, and students and hopefully just find a place where we can just get in touch with the teacher which is our biggest problem now I guess. Okay. Um, I think you guys kind of have a general overview already of uh, GSOC and, and GCI um, but uh, my experience with education was probably uh, so probably when I went to a state university and uh, and found that the education was sorely lacking and particularly access to computers and computer science and um, that's when I started to get interested in it and uh, continued on from there into what I'm doing now. Cool. So um, the next question I have is is probably the big warm-up question now that we know a little bit about you. And we'll, we'll start with Alex and then we'll, we'll go around. So in terms of, of your work with um, the KD Edu project, what have been some of the biggest ta challenges you face? You, you talked about you know trying to get KD Edu in some of the schools, but then you also talked about how you use it as a learning experience. What were some of the challenges? Well, there are plenty of challenges, of course. Uh, the first thing about education, I guess, is that you don't have to convince just one people, but you have to go like with a lot of fronts. Because on one hand, there is like the sysadmin of the school who you, who has to want to have Linux and who has to want to use your tools. Then there's also the governments who always try to force every school to put uh, the software and try to, to have control over that. And in the end, there's also the teachers who need to uh, know the tools that you're providing. They need to have documentation, they need to have like uh, some path to follow for their studies and this all has to be done and well, us as developers, we don't have that 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 kind of power. We, we can like create a lot of applications and we have been doing that a lot. But uh, the big challenge, I guess, is to get in this like big wheel that it's education and it's confirmed by a lot of people, and you have to get it seen somehow. That's why we're getting all these people together or trying to in build out and well showing them with all talks and well trying to come up with something that we all can feel it's our project and make it not just KD Edu, but the free software education project. Does, does anyone have any questions or comments for Alex? Or uh, do you have sort of similar experiences deploying in, in high school? <coughs> I, I have one question. Uh, what's the experience with um, getting uh, people in schools, uh, like teachers or, or the older uh, pupils? Uh, what's the experience with, with uh, getting them involved in actually contributing and writing the software they, they, they use? Well, I don't know if there's anyone who has a better answer than I have, but usually teachers don't want to code and don't want to see, like, code, and of course students won't want to. I mean, there's always the geek of the of the year and everything, but you don't, you're not counting on that because, I mean, there's no point. The, the thing is that we, we are providing software, they have the ideas, and we need them to tell us what to do. That's, I think, is the better flow that just expecting people to do the work for us. Carol, do you have any comments? Yeah, actually, um, so my experience, when I t especially when I talk to particularly high school teachers, is um, they're willing to use whatever it is easiest to teach. Um, and right now it's really easy to teach proprietary software because schools are really set up, if, if they're going to have computer science in, in the curriculum, schools are set up around proprietary software already. Um, I, I think teachers would be just as amenable to, to using open source software if it was just, you know, put down a textbook and here's the curriculum for the year. And also, but actually, yeah, getting back to your point, um, it also matters what the school itself is doing as well because it's going to be a lot easier for the teacher to plug into a particular curriculum or a particular lesson plan if the rest of the school supports it or if the student is learning uh, one aspect of it in, in one class that they're in and a different aspect in a different class that they're in. Um, as opposed to having kind of this siloed, siloed approach. Um, I mean, it would be really cool if a, a student could be working on a GSOC project in, in one class and then go to another class and be working on, on a different component of it um, later on. I think that would be great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of, it is kind of this rolling a, a really heavy ball up a hill because then if you want the schools to get involved, then you have to get the government involved and it just becomes this very, very large uh, pr problem. Go ahead, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm talking from one who has <laughs> government in their pocket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we're very happy with uh, they stated after we were sponsored by the government for a couple of years that you have put free software on the uh, agenda for all education. I think that we can better get a better Dyson <laughs> evaluation than that. That was in 2006. And but the, what we I will emphasize on two things, or three actually. The first is about usability. I think just using the software, and it's done research on it, that's what schools is about. They, they're not really contributing at the first instance of the instance of this. They, they start looking at it, can I use it? Open Office, Firefox, some KDE application, KDE EDU, and th they are just happy. They use it at school and then they asking, can we use it at home? Yeah, you can, thank you. So you have the, you know, the second freedom in free software. And they did, don't really start contributing yet. So it's not there, that's not in the equation. Before, they see, oh, I can actually see that this is in English, this application, and I like it. Can we do something about it? Can you guys help me? And then we say, well, we have this path that you easily can take this PO file, and you can install all the tools you need on your, on your Mac, or on your, you know, basically KBabel was the thing we used back in the days, and we use a new thing now. And then they do that, and they get the file back, and they commit that to the upstream repository. We, we guide that process. So we had teachers translating application that was not available, other in, for instance, Spanish or Catalan, or some other language, and they worked together on that. So using this crowdsource effect, you can actually improve and getting things done. And we have code sprints. So we invite teachers to those sprints and have a guided tour on different ways to contribute to free software, especially translating, but also open courseware, mm -hmm. writing uh, course material, which is, we are not really going to the level we should, but we should do more of all, what I call spoken tutorial because that could really rock it off use of free software. And the re reason this is so easy, because they have freedom to install it at home for free, as in gratis, as in free beer. Question? Yeah, uh, so pardon in advance. This is gonna be part statement, part question, but opportunity for you to correct the statement. We talk about open source and education as, it's, as if it's kind of one big thing. But my perception, at least, is that when you talk about open source and education or getting it into education, in Europe or in Latin America, you're talking about one thing. And when you're talking about North America, especially the US, you're really talking about something completely different because you've got 50 different educational systems in the US and they are far more gamed by uh, proprietary and commercial interests. So those are so the question is kind of aren't these really two different things and don't we need two different strategies for those things? I think I think the goals are the same, but you're right. I think the, the strategies are are different. In at least in South America, it's it's been easier to get them into the schools because you contact the government and the government says, okay, this is great, and they deploy it to all the schools. It's much more pol political in the United States. Uh, I'll let Newt um, answer regarding Europe, uh, but one thing about the United States is I think one of the opportunities to get over that proprietary issue that we're having is charter schools. Charter schools are becoming more popular, more people are uh, turning towards them as alternatives to public schools or expensive private schools, um, but also uh, more people are homeschooling now uh, for various reasons, not just religious reasons. And so I think that's where the KDE Edu project, or just open source and edu like as an educational tool, both as you know providing services, but also as a project, uh, could possibly make headway in the United States. But in terms of getting it into the public schools, it's that's I mean think about how hard it is to get things into textbooks, or where your textbooks come from dictate textbooks. what you're learning in our schools. It's uh, the American education system is a completely different topic, so I, I won't go into that, but that? But, you know, I've been to Indiana, and uh, it's a state in the United States, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry to be arrogant. They actually had their first Linux fest this year. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, mm -hmm. and they have had for years this K-12 project mm -hmm. or conference with free software. And they have a state-driven initiative to work more free software into school education as an advice and also recommend guidelines and all mm -hmm. the things and they have invited other uh, cities and other countries to participate in that and how to do it, how to deploy, and they have also good use cases. For instance, the K-12 LTS project have thousands of schools in the United States already using free software as the default. So not, you know, it's not black and white, which people mostly do, they, they look at the most mm -hmm. worst use case and they say we will not succeed, but what we have seen is that, secondly. But Indiana is definitely an exception that they have laws in place that make it a lot easier to introduce new content to to their curriculum. Where it, uh, one of the yeah. in my professional life, one of the projects that I worked on was homeschooling software for charter schools, and so that's sort of the other end of my interest in uh, the policies that they have to deal with with the schools. But Indiana is a good example. So, so the other story is where where free software are preference, for instance, in India, mm -hmm. which I was just mm -hmm. visiting, where they they, they have. Uh, the mandate when getting support from the government for educational programs, and they have a lot of private schools too, they say you have to evaluate free software before looking to proprietary software. Mm -hmm. And it's a money issue. You know, in India, they are stock broke, most people. And you have the same in Brazil, is the default uh, choice is Linux, but they can, if they want to, go for Windows. And at first they started this program, 35% did. After three years, only 2% did. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's a right price performance, and now we have Russia, and here it comes, here is this challenge. You know, to everybody in the industrial world, when India, when Brazil, when China, when countries in Africa, you know, when Russia, Russia defaults to free software, how would our competitive landscape look like 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. Being stuck with, that, with the steam engines, when the rest mm -hmm. of the world do light you know, movement in the light speed space because they can reuse innovation and knowledge mm -hmm. the way the free software can do. Meaning that when you have YouTube today, no comparison. Me doing breakdance decoding <laughs> old school American <laughs> videos that took me half a year, they can look at YouTube today, they do it in two weeks, maybe mm -hmm. just a couple of days, and decode the dance and they do it. It's the same in software. They can decode, reuse all those things. I call the copyright generation. They are the right to copy. <laughs> I think that'll be a good problem for us to have. I think I think um, if if a, you know, a lot of these countries are come out are developing and end up in the first world, then, and it's because of free software, I think that would be a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> and we will be first in line, you know, yes. that's the biggest problem, they will recruit us three times, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a good, and unfortunately for the manager, they're so, they're so bad in negotiating salary, should improve ourselves there, sorry. <laughs> no, but that's, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions related to Rob? Oh yeah, um, so I, I've got two related questions, and um, quite a link comment, but first comment. Um, so, uh, it, in my other professional life, I am an adjunct instructor for a university, and um, I've tried to incorporate open source software into my teaching, and I've run into the, um, the basically the learning curve. A lot of my students coming in don't have experience with a Unix-based background, and so instead of saying, um, okay, go download this, compile it, we're gonna, you're going to need these Python modules, I found my I find the very first lecture has to be um, this is what a bash shell is this is how you use it this is how it's different than Windows. Um, I have a comment on that, but uh, I don't know if you. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, the thing and this is the other story I want to convey because we had this Vern here in in the states trying to convince and he had used one and a half year convincing all the teachers to using free software and they invited to you know put the top of the argument, inviting every teacher to the meeting, and now we're going to start. And he had the approval from everyone, from the principal. Everything was in order. The software was even installed. And then he started Apache, the bash shell, and the teacher said, why should I uh, teach that? So, and here it comes. He lost the case. He, even if he restarted the presentation, the teacher was not convinced at all, and he ne needed to use another half year to get it restarted, rebooted, and get it rolled out. 
And you have the same situation in the, in the second, uh, what do you call it, the second, uh, help me here, the, I don't know the names on everything. We, we call it a uh, videregående skole. It's the second uh, level, uh, first, it's, uh, it's first and secondary school in the English system. High school. High school. Thank you. Which one? High school. Yes, mm -hmm. say yes. What did you say? Videregående. High school. Yeah. Thank you. So it's <laughs> high school, and 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 you you just then start because computing becomes interesting. And here is where a lot of people get it wrong because they 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 say, oh, my experience is that using the the shell is good and blah blah blah. No, don't do that. Start in the other end. Look up the best production tools you can find in free, find in free software. The best top notch. Either is a Python integrated development environment. I don't know. You know, choose those so you have some buttons to click, mm -hmm. some where to start, and then you start learning the benefit of the shell after that. The, the people do it in the wrong way. They they kind of forces on the 30 years old view on how computer is done instead of starting in the best side of things and then people see the benefit of going to the shell when that's necessary. Mm -hmm. Even Visual Studio got the shell on Windows, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a reason for that. The CP command or Xcopy is really strong on Windows, so you deploy that direct, that way. So I, I guess if you address part of my question, yes. which is where should our emphasis be? Um, because I'm not, I, I'm not a computer scientist, I'm a mechanical engineer. And so in my courses I'm teaching numeric methods. And so I, 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 did, I can't assume that my students come in with all of the groundwork they need in order to work with NumPy and SteePy and the other um, production tools I use. Um, and so I end up defaulting back to that. And so if you could address that, where should our emphasis be as either um, people wanting to bring the tools in or as educators who would like to use those tools but find ourselves stymied because we don't have the support we need. I have another take, the third take on that. I'm very excited here because I've done this a lot. Yes. Is, is, is that what the other thing that the Indian people, the, the government are, are doing in their project is spoken tutorials. So the students are kind of set there to self-study some of that and it's really well explained how they should do every different part. And you also need a really good motivation round because you tell me that you have some really professional good tools, which is the reality out there. This is what they're gonna use. And they can state in, in, in this big scheme of things that they won't use it because it's, they will be out of work. It's not, I'm a, you know, I was learning electronics back in the days. You have to use a lot of mediocre tools, but that's the one businesses are using. That's why you get a, get a job done, okay? So sometimes you need to enforce that. Can you just move your head a little there? Thank you. <laughs> then you can um, enforce that view on uh, on that those students that doing this as a motivational job, explaining, as you said, you have to do some basics to get in there. But isn't this what education is about? I, I was actually going to dovetail off of that yeah. because I think I think it's um, there's probably hundreds of different things you could teach them. You could have a, an entire year's course on just learning Python, or you could have an entire year's course on any of a number of things. But um, I think what the, what the point is, is to make, is to give them tools that will help them in industry later, obviously, since that's kind of the point of education. Um, but also, I think, um, I was talking to, I think, Jeff about this earlier today, um, kind of giving them the open source way, which is see a problem, figure out how to fix it, like become self self motivated and self sufficient and, and enthusiastic about things. Um, I I would actually say it's not so much what they learn; it's it's that they learn to learn and to teach themselves. I think that's one of the, the best and most awesome things about open source is that you see a problem, you go fix it, and you say say, hey, I fixed this for you, and everybody benefits from it. Um, and oh by the way, you're cool because you fixed our problem. Um, it's not per se the problem that you fixed, it's the fact that you got involved and you were motivated and interested in it. Um, Jeff, you had a question? So I have a, it's a, a two-part question for you, um, mainly, uh, and I'll, I'll just say both parts uh, up front. So one is, uh, when I was watching Alex's presentation earlier, then when he showed how, uh, you know, if you wrote the Wizards, that you could just see all the KDE projects, immediately check it out, et cetera, uh, it strikes me as the exact kind of thing that you're talking about where you give them you know, the good tools right up front have some buttons they can push, and you make it clear to them how to use it, and then they can just get started without having to go to, you know, the, the lowest common denominator of tools. Um, so I was wondering if you had a comment on, on that functionality in, in K-Develop. And the second part is, 
you know, if you think that that's a, a, that that can serve that kind of purpose, what are your thoughts on developing alternative um, uh, views that are specifically geared towards education for uh, programs like Kdevelop, where you know the students aren't necessarily going to need all the advanced functionality, but the functionality that they do need will be highlighted and, and readily uh, you know, apparent and available. Yeah, uh, I think this is a two-part answer to that. Yeah. Because it goes on granularity of functionality, and I think one of the projects has has aimed at that most is actually one that the Pershal and the Sugar Desktop and Activity Scheme, they got built into the to every application, mm -hmm. meaning that you can follow the path of the tasks you have done in application. You can rerun those tasks as kind of a recorded activity, and you can learn from it by what you've done in totally different context. You're maybe making music in the music classes, or you're doing math, doing some calculation, or you're making a short snip, a program snip, that do something, making some drawings or something, which is really fun. And they can do all that to the program, but they can also review what they've done, and if they really want to get into the details, they, they can actually go in and code. But to, to here is where people go get it sometimes wrong, because they expect you know, three third graders to program. And it's not always like that. You have to em you have to put that in front of them in a context with other teaching things. Meaning, if you teach math, you can show them the value of of uh, trajectories by showing the <coughs> math into a simulation, and they can make that simulation themselves by using e toys. So they they don't they program the the path, but then they understand the math behind it much smarter. And it takes less than one hour to do. It's not that difficult. The problem is actually the, what I talked about, the spoken tutorials and other things that can help teachers doing this teaching because they don't know computers at all or the, only the text editor or the spreadsheet because they have learned office work, which is totally wrong and believe me, deadly boring for kids. <laughs> Never give it to them, but they do. So what you should do instead is make these simulations and such. This is what he works on with his project, if I understood correctly, inviting everybody in and make that explanation how to use it, get the application better, all those things. And the strange thing is he is making the tools that we grown up talk about teachers are going to use. So it's a really exciting thing where the youth are making the teaching <laughs> for the old. It's kind of mess. Messy, but it's <laughs> actually also those who make the tools we are teaching. It's it's it's, it's a mind boggling actually to think <laughs> about because usually traditionally it's the older people to explain the younger ones. Here is the it, turn around, and I think we need to do that in free software. Do you have any comments about Jeff's suggestions? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, KDevelop wasn't meant to be a tool for teaching, although it could be used to it and. Well, I guess it should be adapted to, but yes, of course, all, all these things uh, yeah, can can be used, and there's a lot of extension that we could put so that it could be a be better tool. But um, in that regard, uh, on I think that uh, the important thing on free software and education is not l l l that the children uh, learn to code itself, but that the children are using free software tools. That's the first part that we should get there. And also to get the teachers to understand how the free software community work. Uh, one of the biggest problems I've had while talking to teachers and all these people is that, for for instance, it was a, a very small talk and we were showing KTurtle. KTurtle is a logo application, it's really nice and it does like the same as any proprietary logo uh, machine. And uh, a teacher uh, said us, yes, but this one doesn't have, I don't know, a feature that did something like really simple, but I mean, it was not on the menu. And the thing is that the teacher couldn't come up with going to boxkd.org or something like that and reporting to us what, what's uh, their need. And that's the biggest lacking that we're having. Actually, now we're having like a very big deployment in Brazil or well, all these places uh, that said. And we're not getting bug reports from these people, and that's the, our biggest problem right now. Uh, just to add to that, teachers have literally, uh, especially if I, I am from Norway, so what they do is they make their own curriculum. 
teaching material and I keep it like this and they won't, don't want to share. So the strange thing is that the teacher who by default share to the kids, they keep their own teaching material secret because they don't dare to show it. And that also reflects back to the free software projects as you have experienced. They don't they want to share or they complain maybe because they're excellent in complaining. They know every trick in complaining. <laughs> and they have teach uh, pupils and parents to learn from, so they know everything. But, but just that dialogue, fostering that dialogue is really expensive and tough. But we have seen in the Rheinland Pfalz project in Germany, but they have invited in teachers, 20 of making the tutorials for the teachers sharing knowledge as you point out and then they also report back that's a part of the thing okay i need this feature it might not be there let's talk on that and point to the right direction and you might need a translator a person who know how to translate that's a requirement yeah. to a developer which is not the issue because it's not in their mindset doing it well, I think it's a it's a total paradigm shift. I mean, we we kind of we when a lot of people the way they think of, of software is uh, you produce a software package that is exactly what they think that the users want, and it has and it's very clean and polished and has everything right there. And if you need something else, you're just going to have to deal with the fact that it doesn't exist, and it's and maybe you'll get it in the next release. Um, and and oh by the way, it's all kind of a closed walled garden. Uh, whereas this is kind of a shift to it's not there. You could actually probably put look at the code and try and figure it out how to put it in yourself, or you could file a bug report and ask somebody to, to try and fix it for you. Um, and I think that's just a totally different mindset for a lot of people. Or even better, you can ask a student project to do it. Yes, in exactly. Google, go, go, go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tutoring them, asking you for money. Yay. <laughs> so we have about five minutes left, and just sort of to, to, to make this you know full circle, um, Maybe just 30 seconds or less um, answer. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I thought we ended quarter after three. No, we ended three about three. Oh, wow. Yay. Does anybody have any additional questions <laughs> on challenges That's since we, we have so time. much time? <laughs> no, oh, well, then we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> but you don't need to take 30 seconds. You can take even longer. Um, Carol, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. So five, 10, 15 years, whatever time period you want to think about this, what is a direction or what is a, 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 a goal or accomplishment that you would like to see with open source and education? Um, well, uh, I alluded it to, to a little in my talk. Um, my, I would love to see that if I'm a, a college student in 10 years or 15 years is thinking about college and thinking about going into computer science, that they could choose to either major or minor in open source software. That it could be there could be some part of their curriculum that they that would just be integrated in. Basically, here is here is all these things you can do in, in open source as well. Um, and I, th I think we're still a bit of, of a ways away from that, but I think that would be um, absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? What does an open source major look like? Um, well, for example, I think, um, well, I mean, it, in, if you're majoring in, in computer science, you probably have a class in, say, um, there, there's probably classes that include proprietary software packages. So for example, I, I, would, I would be awesome if there could be uh, open source options for all of those things. Um, alternatively, if we could like, for example, you could have it integrated into the four years that you're in school, that every summer you do an internship for an open source project. Wouldn't that be awesome? Um, and that was just kind of included, maybe maybe that was included in the in the requirements is that you, is you get involved in the community in some way. Um, or if, um, for example, at the end when you're doing your senior thesis, instead of presenting it to a professor or to the class, what you're actually doing it is submitting that as a, Huge patch back to back to the organization, and then they, your, and then their code review is basically your your passing grade on your final. Wouldn't it, that be cool? Taking it from some schools that focus on multidisciplinary majors, I could see free culture or open source as your major, but then you specialize in something such as communications or politics yeah. or computer science, and because a big part of open source isn't just 
knowing what the license is and knowing what the technology is, it's also, we take it for granted because we're living in it, but we're also aware of a whole lot of other parts of free culture. I mean, Creative Commons is mostly communication based, but it's some policy. But once you start getting into policy, you start getting into politics. Once you start getting into politics, you start getting into history. Once you start getting into history, you start getting into, you know, humanitarian specializations and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be great if you could, you could, uh, uh, you're, you want to be a lawyer and you could potentially minor in open source software licensing? I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? Uh, th things along that line, yeah. Any other comments? Any other? Questions for Carol? Yeah, I think we are less uh, ambitious. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, I, I said some market statistics showing that 70, 80% of commercial sold software is including free software. That's a major part. Mm -hmm. So if you're not learning free software in education, you are discrediting or removing 80% of the market and you're left with 20. Yeah. And in this work market, in the United States, how much is the youth employ uh, employment rate here? And how much is the unemployment rate? In Sweden, it's 30. Yeah. You know, hmm. we are, it's some untuned thing here because those countries who, who now <laughs> teach free software, that will be the default as in India. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you know, people even had this debate in 2011. We are defaulting to free software. The proprietary software is the exception. And this should be reflected in the education. It will, yes, it will take 10 years because they are stuck in old ways. Yeah, absolutely. But that's, an, that, that's a stuck. It's not about the realities in the industry. Oh, yeah. No, I, absolutely. And in fact, that's probably why there's, I'm, I think a lot of people are so concerned about it is because it's not actually a reflection of what the, in, what, the way the industry is going. And they, they kind of use 7% of the software market of the shelf products and 93% is something else. And then most of that is free software. And, and here it comes. I was at the meeting in um, uh, Gran Canaria last year, and I was meeting the Minister of Education. He wondered, how can we ignite our future? You know, we have 24% unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. And the same for Spain, a lot of Spains, because they built, sorry to say, they built all this building for the rest of Europe being on vacation, yes. and <laughs> it didn't succeed <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and and. We need to do something with our hands and our minds in the future. And it obviously will be something in environmental, it will be much more reused, we will do services for the older, which will be more. And the Indians can't solve all that problem for us. We need to do something ourselves. I mean, that big scheme of things, then I think sharing of knowledge, free culture, should be the default before doing the exception. Uh, proprietary software. So since you have the floor, why don't you tell us what your 5, 10, 15 year old The thing is that are. every time I do that, I get it wrong. <laughs> Last time I did Maybe it. Maybe you'll get it right this yeah. time. I said DRM will win, <laughs> it lost. I said, you know, we will be stuck with proprietary things. And, you know, my advice reading them 10 years or 7 years is so bad. So you will not put money in my mouth. Oh, we have it on tape. <laughs> yeah, Come on, make it's a even guess. better. Make a guess. Yes, my hope is that 90 or 80 percent of the phones, okay, okay, I will be killed, uh, will be free software based. That so is you can my hope. Retire. So I can retire. <laughs> and and uh, and really, the reason I and here's the strange thing: the reason I do free software is to get real work done. That's my reason. So if I were work in some other industry with software or some electronics, whatever, I'm just happy. As long as the innovation is open to share. And I think the last next 10 years, that will be acknowledged and the default, as we saw with uh, Jim from... Uh, exactly. So let's do that. And, and if we can join that project, and with India, Russia, China, mm -hmm. Brazil, mm -hmm. Africa with us, which can do great things. You know, I invite the United States with that project. They actually invented the thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I was I was recently at a at a, uh, a tech talk talking about you know innovation and in, in you know GDP and you know where is the world going in the next twenty years? And the United States is responsible for like eighty percent of basic science, and then other countries just buy our science and then go make pro products based off of our basic science and make all the money. Exactly. It's really, it, we're really good at laboratory science, but we're really bad at product design. Yeah. Uh, Alex? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that in the future, I, I'd hope that uh, on in one hand that uh, we can get all the creativity of from students and teachers, like materializing on improving the education system. I think that this should be the well the conclusion of our work somehow. And well, on the other hand, and it's very links is to be able to share everything and all this creativity that's being like moved in the world that can be shared so that we can all uh, learn from others work because it's what it's education about and that's why we are doing it and that's why we are here and that's why free software I think is the only way to go with education. Does anyone have any questions based off of what they've said to the future of education and open source or even any general question that you'd like to ask any of the panelists now that we have them in front of the camera under the lights and <laughs> under attention. So going back to that concept of an open source major, mm -hmm. uh, I'm an undergrad back at Akron, Ohio, and many of the other grads in my class have the idea that proprietary software is where the money's at, so they have no real incentive to go out and learn open source stuff. Like they spend all their life learning the .NET API and all that stuff because they don't have any feeling of value from open source software. What kind of, what, what do you think could work to work against that? Or I, I've heard a lot of people saying that as well, that, that for some reason colleges and, and high schools and colleges aren't getting the signals back from industry that what they want in their graduates is people who are, are versatile in, in open source software and instead, yeah, they're do basically just teaching them .NET APIs. Um, I think, as Newt said, like the, I don't know, I don't know where the disconnect is, but this is not the way industry is going, and those signals need to be getting back to education. Um, may, maybe the corporations are not doing a good enough job of saying this is these are the kinds of candidates that we are looking for, and this is what we want to see on your resume, and it, and it doesn't include Microsoft.NET stuff. Um, uh, I, I would certainly hope that I, I mean I'd, I'd like to say that I think Google's doing a pretty good job of that, but I don't know that other <coughs> other corporations maybe are as well. And it's certainly I mean certainly even if even if 30 major corporations are doing it, it might not be sending the right signals overall to to our back to our education systems. Alex, do you have a comment? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, in that regard, I was talking a uh, couple of weeks ago with uh, some organizer in a Span Spanish uh, event we are having. He's a uh, high school teacher. He is the like the computer teacher in the school, and he was saying that uh, whenever he can, he is teaching proprietary software. And the main reason is that it's where the m the market is. And well, I was thinking of it, and what what I s told him is that when I was on school, um, I was uh, taught uh, Microsoft Office, I guess ninety eight or two thousand something like that. I mean. Who cares right now? <coughs> Whatever I was, I learned back then. Wouldn't that wouldn't that have been the same to learn Open Office or something like that? And it's the same. I mean, can you imagine yourself using the same uh, .NET API in 20 years? It doesn't make sense. The the computer science world doesn't work that way. Um, um, I think you were first, and then uh, Jeff. So where they where they're not getting the signal? I mean, if you look at the vast majority of software that people actually see, um, it's proprietary. Even you know everything they interact with from Google is not open source. Um, the, s the software that schools are using uh, is not open source. The signals, what they're using, is not open source primarily. Even if they go, you know, and they they you know you guys <coughs> have the free product apps for your domain that you give to schools. It's not open, so that's where they're getting those signals. I think that goes back to what uh, Newt said earlier, where sure, uh, at the surface level, everything is proprietary. But if you look at proprietary, most of it's using free software in order to get their job done, and they're only putting their own stuff on top of it. So you, you still need to produce open source or free software. It's just that it has a, I mean, it has a TM or whatever you want to put on it on the box. The, the ironic thing is that companies love to hire open source people, open source developers to yeah, actually Yeah, actually that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. But is it because they have better skills or is it because they know they know the software? Uh, 
you have a comment to that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of course they have better skills. <laughs> no, I mean, I, honestly, like I said earlier, growing up as a shape pretty geek, and, you know, I, I, I personally owe a great debt of gratitude to the open source community at large because being like a hungry teenager or uh, on it, honestly, like rather than getting myself into trouble, I sat around hack, hacking on stuff in the, the playful sense of figuring out and teaching myself and becoming involved that direction through, through the community and the, the wealth of information, whether it was good documentation or just like you could actually traverse a, a project and figure out how it works or whatever. The, 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 the fundamental knowledge that you learn of collaboration is a much much, much desired thing in corporations. And since then, I've had several, you know, managers and even the, the, the last company I worked for, the CEO would routinely take me and one other guy that was an open source contributor in the group we worked for and take us out to lunch and be like, how can we run this business more like an open source project, even though we're proprietary? We know that, but we run on, you know, the open source innards. But the, the, the collaboration that just inherently happens, you know, like, or seems to inherently happen in, in, the, in the open source community is a much to be desired and, a, you know, becoming even more verbosely written on, like, you know, Harvard Business Journal is writing on open source collaboration and how to bring that into your business. And whether or not it's actually getting the source code out there, the, the, the mentality of the open source community is, I think, a tenfold more desired than the software itself, even if you're not in a software, like, you know, if you're, not, you're not a software company, that, that mentality is more than gold in, in, the, in, the, in the corporations. So uh, I think one of the answers to why why colleges don't tell students this is that if you, you know, if you're a student and you go and you look at Hot Jobs and Monster and, and all the other job sites that are around, what you see is, is listings for essentially commodity developer mm -hmm. positions. Um, you see a lot of listings for .NET developers, for uh, you know various types of, of uh, you know, Java web development, etc. But really, that's that's a fairly commodity market, and there's tons of developers, and those are jobs that are pretty easily outsourced. And you know, I think that part of the problem is that the visibility of, of a lot of open source projects and consulting on those is not very, uh, you know, it's just not visible. Like right? if you want support for an open source project, usually you go directly to the source and you say. If there isn't a company there, you go to one of the developers and say, you know, can I buy a support contract from you? And the fact that, you know, it's not advertised that you can do that doesn't at all mean that you can't actually go and do that. And you can make very good money. So the, the company I've worked for, we currently bought 80 hours of support from some open source developer at $125 an hour. That's, you know, that's, and, and he's busy all the time. If you keep that up for 40 hours a week for 48 weeks a, a year, that's a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah, so and actually. That, that's salary. <laughs> and actually going back to the that's where the money is sure yeah you can you could probably make some money as a commodity developer but but I would actually say the inverse is true that where the actual money is is not in being a commodity developer right. it's in being really versed uh, really well versed in a lot of different open source languages and, and right but, but the visibility isn't there yeah right I couldn't I couldn't agree more because with the key term is commoditization to say that's where all the jobs are you could say the same thing about Fast food. Yeah, Burger there's, there's that's lots of jobs, the jobs at McDonald's. Are. Working at Walmart. That's where the jobs are. <laughs> there's 10,000 jobs waiting for you to to be a greeter at Target. That's awesome. Yeah. But that's not a career path for people. Yeah, exactly. Right. So there's the inversion. Of, you know, certainly there's the the very fact that um, the demand is high, supply is low. It's simple economics. That that's. I mean, if if you want, if you're looking as a college student for a paycheck, you are not going to be an MCSE. You know. Uh, Unfortunately, you want computer science people to be driven off of passion and curiosity, etc. But for those that uh, need to pay off their student loans afterwards, certainly. Um, I mean, the top story right now on CNN, and God forbid that I'm actually quoting CNN on camera right now, <laughs> as, as, as a news source, an infotainment source. Uh, the top story on CNN.com right now is about the uh, uh, job tech boom in Silicon Valley and the. Uh, programming languages that they cite that are in demand are uh, Python, Ruby, PHP, and Java. They do not list anything else. Yeah. So <laughs> they don't list Qt, but <laughs> you will be there. Yeah. But the point is, I mean, it's it's the top story right now on a major U.S. news site, and yeah. that's the technology.
But I, th I think it was. I think what's interesting, to, what is not mentioned, is all the web development and all those in-house systems, also in bank and finance. A lot of those are well based on free software components, either programming language or even added components to make the whole glue the glue together, and they run it on Linux. And it's the default in bank and finance, as we saw with Jim Semlin yesterday. So what is our biggest weakest is our weakness is to marketing, classical marketing, where we're competing on companies for 25, 30 years have doing evangelistic sales of their software, which is for biggest weakness, but maybe our biggest strength because we are so sober. <laughs> but remember this, proprietary software, according to Bill Gates, their success is ironically, basically, evangelization. And we are so sober, so we don't do it, but maybe we should do more of that. So we only have a few minutes yeah, left. We actually only have a few minutes left. Yeah, we, we <laughs> this time we yeah. only have a few minutes left. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and I will do the 30 seconds or less. Just any final thoughts, advice, a position that you want to get out there and on camera. Um, we'll start <coughs> at the beginning again. 30 seconds. Yeah, two things. We need spoken tutorials and online teaching material easy to adapt and use. That's my most important message. Also, we need to understand that users are different than developers, so we need to take the user's perspective, helping them, not taking our good craftsmanship into play where they, it's not fitted. We need to use graphical application, good teaching application, that's the KDE, DU, and things you have made. Alex? Oh, well, I'd just like to say that if there's anyone who's interested on education software and wants to join us on our mailing list, IRC chats, or anything, we're very good people. We, we are very nice, and we will welcome him <laughs> or her. And well, and if somebody knows a teacher or someone interested on the on the world and wants to show them KDE, that's always a plus. <laughs> Uh, student applications close on Friday for GSOC. <laughs> 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 Tell all the university students you know to apply. All right, well, uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause.